Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. lectureship applications and the um, Graham School course proposals. We're trying to get that rescheduled for like next Tuesday or Wednesday, so just stay tuned. We will probably extend the application deadline from the 6th to maybe the middle of the following week just to give you uh, a little bit more time after that uh, information panel. And if you're planning to apply to FLAS, the deadline is February 6th. If you have any questions about that, as always, Feel free to email me or set up an appointment through America. So, happy fourth week. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Any lecture, workshop things you want to know? Okay then. Well, um, I'll just mention that next week's <coughs> guest speaker is Chad Broughton, who is uh, with the Public Policy Division, and he's going to be speaking. Um, Mostly about a book that he recently wrote called Boom Bust Exodus. And he did a lot of field work in, I want to say Naperville, Illinois, but that doesn't sound right now that I say it. Galesville? Some a town in Illinois. And Galesburg. 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 Okay. Galesburg, Illinois, which used to have an auto plant and also the town of Mexico where that plant was relocated to. So it's about globalization. And I think it's going to be a fantastic talk, so please join us next week. Uh, but before that, we have today's fantastic talk. So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce today's guest, who's directly behind me, Michael Petras. He is a licensed clinical psychologist at the university's student counseling service, and he's also our Divinity School community liaison. He has a primary focus in psychotherapy assessment and consultation. He does a lot of other things, but he's I want to get to his talk. Yeah. How being smart can make you dumb. <laughs> Mindset, happiness, and our suit. So please turn off your phone ringer thing and then join me in one of the doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. Um, you know, as Taryn just said, I'm a, I'm a psychologist uh, at the University of Student Counseling Service. I'm also the new liaison for the Divinity School. It's a new program that we started uh, liaising with all the graduate school programs. Um, I primarily do clinical work, which is psychotherapy, evaluations, consultation, as she mentioned. But I also coordinate our ADHD assessment protocol, so I do those uh, evaluations. And I have a particular interest in technology, technology and how that intersects with psychological concepts. Um, so what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about how I work with students, some of the concepts and ideas that I found to be helpful. Um, I'll try to save some time at the end for questions and dialogue, but if you guys have anything along the way, just let me know. Um, so 
How Being Smart Makes You Dumb, Mindset, Happiness, and Our Students. Pretty catchy title, I guess. Uh, I can't take full credit for it. I actually borrowed part of it from a friend of mine who wrote a blog post exploring the work of uh, psychologist Carol Dweck. Um, she, so she works on a concept called mindset. I don't know, is anyone here familiar with her work at all? Um, well, that's good. Uh, some, some of the terms might be new to you, but the, most of the ideas probably won't be. They're fairly intuitive. These are things mostly we already know, but we have a tendency to forget uh, in our culture that's sometimes overly focused on results, winning, success, at the expense of process, learning, and control. Um, so what I will do uh, is talk a little bit about my, my background, how I came to these ideas. Um, uh, I'll talk about Carol, Carol and her work and her ideas around mindset, how that relates to happiness and some, some of the interventions I use with people, uh, and then talk about our resources in student counseling and answer the questions. The general idea behind uh, mindset is that, and this is quoted from Carol, she says, in a fixed mindset, students believe that their basic abilities, their intelligence, their talents are just fixed traits. They have a certain amount, that, and that's that. And then their goal becomes to look smart at all times and never look dumb. In a growth mindset, students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort and through teaching and persistence. They don't necessarily think that everyone's the same or anyone can be Einstein, but they believe everyone can get smarter if they work at it. So these mindsets in general apply to more than just intelligence and can be swapped out for many different kinds of talents, abilities, and characteristics. Uh, what I've seen in working with students in Chicago is that this general idea, this, this concept is relevant with pretty much every student I've worked with in some shape or form. Um, while there are clearly many bright and talented people here, I found that it's important to consider ways in which those talents and abilities can also serve as risk factors, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, for the beliefs and mindsets that we hold, while ultimately having a big impact on the ability to find happiness and thrive in lived experience. So, uh, so in the process of doing this, I'll also um, try to demonstrate some of the methods that I use, which often include readings, videos, other multimedia interventions. It's not unusual for when I work with students to use books, blog posts, like um, my friend I mentioned before, videos, TED Talks, uh, kind of mashing up a bunch of different media to help engage students in the process in a more interesting way. So, um, so I work at the Student Counseling Service as a psychologist, as, as most people seem to think that our work is something like this. Uh, what it's usually more like, and this might be hard to read, is you have a little lemon there saying, everyone tries to make me into lemonade, but I just can't be something I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's like that. I mean, the, this image kind of cracks me up. The pineapple, for one, and you can't help but feel a little empathy for that little lemon. <laughs> So, well, um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about my personal experience around these kinds of issues and how, how that brought me to my research and then my work. So, um, this whole process started for me when I was in fourth grade. In my school at the time, we had a program that was called Discovery. And it was a gifted and talented program, um, which all I knew at the time was that the smart kids got pulled out to go there a few times a week, and they seemed to be having a lot of fun doing interesting things. Uh, I desperately wanted to be a part of it, but it wasn't for me that year. And I remember feeling despondent and demoralized at the time because I was convinced that it meant I was stupid and that I would never be smart again. You know, so this is a fourth grader. Uh, I mention this because I'll, these thoughts and feelings are important. I think they factor into the sort of mindset I need in general. The next year, I was somehow pulled into and accepted in the program, and it was an absolute blast. Um, in the small pull-out classes, we were given the freedom to think creatively, to problem solve, to explore ideas and concepts to collaborate on fascinating projects and experiments. It was honestly one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life, and still lives in my memory as an example of what education can and maybe should be. But that's another talk to come together. Um, but while participating in Discovery, the important thing was, um, I met a friend of mine who I will call Thomas here. Uh, Thomas was an unusual kid. He was extremely intelligent, but also very sensitive. He seemed to have a nearly photogenic, photographic memory could solve problems without even really trying. However, Thomas was also incredibly volatile in class and often acted out in ways that I didn't really understand at the time. 
He was really shy, had a tendency to avoid, avoid most of our peers. Um, but in being in this group together, we became really close friends. Um, in talking with him, he was really aware that he was perceived as different from other kids. And he talked about it all the time. I later came to know and understand that he, was, he had been diagnosed with pediatric bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and that being in that gifted program was a huge source of positivity and support in his life. Uh, it was a place where he felt understood and was able to connect with some other students. For me, you know, I enjoyed it and I felt like I, I really liked the program and thinking back on it, you know, Thomas really needed that program. Uh, and while I didn't know it at the time, and that, that, that experience and that friendship were tuning me into experiences of difference and how they manifest in people's lives, I became curious about how experiences outside the norm impact people's lived experiences and how giftedness could perhaps contribute to some risk factors and social and emotional difficulties with children, adolescents, and adults. Um, so I should say that these ideas of studying and working with this population is kind of perplexing for many people in the clinical field. The general idea seems to be, you know, these kids are smart, they can figure it out for themselves. Um, but in doing research and working with kids and adolescents and adults, realizing it's far from the truth most of the time. Um, so my experience, I, I, I did undergrad at University of Wisconsin in Madison. Those early experiences shaped, shaped my life in pretty profound ways and guided my education and career choices going forward. So at Madison, I studied psychology and philosophy. I worked in a lab studying motivation and goal setting uh, and how that impacts people's performance. So that, that was actually a nice uh, segue from what I was doing earlier in, in my career. Um, when I got out of college, I worked in a child psychiatric and adolescent unit, which um, it, it, it tuned me into more issues of difference, identity, assessment, and treatment, uh, and it became very real for me. I loved working with the children and often felt at a loss as to how to best help these kids. Uh, in many ways, it was, it was heartbreaking because uh, they would come in and stay with us for a few days to a few weeks and make significant improvement, um, and then go back to environments that were unhealthy or rigid and unhelpful, and then the same symptoms would show up. So at that point, I... Um, I decided to pursue a doctorate in clinical psychology, psychology so, I, so I could do more. Um, while in, in school, my main area of focus was exploring issues related to the gifted experience with the idea that I would specialize in working with that population and in unique presentations and risk factors that they present. All of my training experiences and ultimately my dissertation was all tilted toward this area. My dissertation was uh, looking at uh, the being in the world of for students that have been identified as gifted and diagnosed with bipolar disorder, so living in the world with both of those experiences. Uh, and what I found, it was, it was a fairly intense process doing this research, and what I found was that, it, as you might imagine, it was a lot more complex than it might have seemed. Um, so something that, you know, like the bipolar label, which was ostensibly kind of a negative pathologizing label, often portrayed in a negative light, um, people spoke positively about it in some ways, that it helped to organize their experience provide a language to connect with others and engage in treatment. Uh, and then what I also found, and more importantly for this talk in some ways, is that the gifted label, which is seemingly very positive, identified for a lot of students, um, had a lot of sort of negative and painful aspects associated with it. And it was while working on my dissertation that I first was exposed to the work of Carol Dweck. So through her work at the research at Yale, Columbia, Harvard, and countless other elementary and high schools throughout the world, Dr. Dweck hit upon a simple idea that gets it why a lot of smart, talented, ambitious people experience anxiety and struggle to fulfill their potential. And uh, this, this is actually in my dissertation, this quote, I'll just read it here. She says, the term gifted conjures up an entity theory. It implies that some entity, a large amount of intelligence, has been magically bestowed upon students, making them special. Thus, when students are so labeled, some may be over-concerned with justifying the label and less concerned with seeking challenges that enhance their skills. They may also begin to act, react more poorly to setbacks, worrying that mistakes, confusions, or failures mean that they don't deserve the coveted label. If being gifted makes them special, then losing the label may mean to them that they are ordinary and somehow less worthy. And you know, this is sort of the, the general idea at the, the basis of her work and, and explores in a lot of different directions, uh, has important clinical, developmental, and cultural concerns that were the heart of my dissertation, the core of my work since then. So for this next part here, I just have some questions for you guys to consider. I'd like you for you to read these, take a few minutes, and just think about you know what your reaction is here. 
So if you can't read them, the first one is your intelligence is something very basic about uh, you that you can't change very much. The second one is you can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. The third one is no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it quite a bit. And the fourth one, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. So think about whether you mostly agree or disagree with any of those questions. Um, the, the first two, as you, as you can probably guess, are fixed mindset questions. The second two are growth mindset questions. Um, obviously, people can be a mixture, but tend to lean one way or the other. Uh, and you can also have these beliefs about other abilities. So you can substitute things instead of intelligence, like artistic talent, sports ability, business skills, uh, or even characteristics of a person, like the kind of person you would be, whether you believe those are more fixed as traits as part of who you are, or things that you can develop and grow and change. So, you know, another question to ask is when do you feel smart? When you're flawlessly perfect, or when you're learning, confronting challenges, and making progress? I think that hits it at, at the mindset as well. So, in, uh, in Carol's book, Mindset, which I would highly encourage everyone to read, just, it's an easy read and it hits at these concepts and uh, it's really interesting. You might find yourself in there in some way. Um, she's continued to pursue the idea in expressive and really creative ways that hits close to home for many of our students here at the university. Um, so I blew that one up a little bit. And this one, it sort of gets broken down. In a fixed mindset, intelligence is viewed as static. Uh, leads to a desire to look smart and 